Hi, I'm Ann Rietzelbach, Program Director of the Architectural League. I'd like to welcome you to the second of four nights of presentations by this year's Emerging Voices. This series is made possible through the generosity of the program sponsors. On behalf of the League, I'd like to sincerely thank principals, supporters, and enthusiasts, Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown. Additional support for the Emerging Voices program is provided by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and by the Next Generation Fund of the Architectural League, supported by a group of past Emerging Voices and League Prize winners. Architectural League programs are also supported, in part, by public funds from the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature, as well as by members of the Architectural League. Please consider joining the League. You can find membership information on our website. The Emerging Voices program was launched 40 years ago during the Architectural League's centennial as part of the League's ongoing commitment to recognize, nurture, and share the work of young and emerging architects and designers. Each year, the Emerging Voices jury selects eight practices based in the United States, Canada, or Mexico through an invited juried portfolio competition that recognizes talented individual, individuals and firms with a distinct design voice and a body of accomplished work in the broadest sense from installations and community organizing to explorations of fabrication methods and realized commissions that has the potential to influence the disciplines of architecture, landscape architecture, and urbanism. To learn more about past and recent winners and their work, including lecture videos and interviews, please check out the League's website. This year's jury examined truly accomplished examples of the breadth of contemporary architecture practice during a two-step process of selecting this year's winners. First, evaluating work and design statements from about 50 firms to create a short list of candidates, and then reviewing more extensive and truly outstanding portfolios from about 20 finalists in the process of selecting the eight 2022 Emerging Voices. We are grateful for the time, considered expertise, and enthusiasm of the 2022 jury, Ursula Kripa, Paul Lewis, Zach Mortis, Rashida NG, Shalina Albert, Susan Scott, Saidi Springall, Sarah Zode, and tonight's program moderator, Mark Neveu. Mark is the head of the architecture program in the design school at Arizona State University. In that role, in his words, he is helping to imagine what it means to be an architecture program within the model of a new American university. His research explores the role of storytelling, both in pedagogy and practice. He is the past executive editor of the biannual peer-reviewed Journal of the Architecture Journal of Architectural Education. Mark will introduce each of tonight's firms, and after their presentations, will follow up with a conversation with the speakers. He will also pass along questions from the audience, which you should post in the Q&A section. Please also watch for information about CEUs, which will appear in the chat towards the end of the presentations. That I pass it over to Mark. It's been a, a real uh, pleasure to uh, work in this project and to see all the all the work presented. It's been a, it was a really incredible sort of conversation. What I'm going to do quickly is introduce both of the practices, and then I'll talk a little bit about the the, the conversation around the two uh, two practices in the um, in the deliberation. So, Jazz Studio is a Toronto-based practice led by Iranian Canadian architects Benaz Asadi and Nima. Javidi. The studio's work emphasizes light wood frame construction, geometric experimentation, and vernacular form. From the narrow plots of Toronto's Queen West neighborhood to large-scale international design competitions, Ja Architecture Studio employs a one-to-one -one process defined by Asadi and Javidi as a design approach shaped through, quote, the physical register of immigration, of being slightly off from the context that you aspire to fit within struggle with and eventually change, end quote. Tianyang Design is a research and creative practice based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Its work advances, quote, innovations that are not only more in tune with contemporary building processes, but are also aspirational in integrating socially, ethically, and environmentally driven imperatives, end quotes. Focus on experimentations with concrete and the intersections of clothing, manufacturing, and architecture the practice interrogates the many facets and forms of labor in the R&D field. So 
both of these practices were um, pretty, I wouldn't say easy choices, but there was a lot of agreement around, because there were a lot of good work, but there, there was a lot of agreement around the value uh, in both of these practices. And it's a really, I think, interesting pairing because um, on one hand, there's a real embeddedness to place, yet there are real questions of identity and belonging and community on one hand. There's also a really interesting relationship across the two practices between the scale of work. So Ja Architecture Studio speaks directly about working one-to-one. -one. Tian's work is very much about a kind of one-on-one -on -one practice. There's very little um, sort of scale or representation in the work. There's also a real interest in material and not just a focus or a fetishization of material, but an interest in the entire sort of uh, scale of material, right? So the not only how does concrete perform, but also how might um, the kind of impact uh, environmental and otherwise of concrete be considered and reconsidered. There's also an interest across both practices in geometry, um, one perhaps more formal, another one perhaps more found, but geometry plays a role uh, in, in each practice. And so, I think the the one of the the takeaways from the jury was that all of those things are intertwined. It's not just a kind of fetishization of identity or of material or of geometry or one of one of those things. It's actually a really both practices are developing, promoting, interrogating a kind of intertwining of all those things at once. And really underlying it is a, a real social a social mission that I think is is uh, really important. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Anne. Thank you. Toronto has two missing middles, one in the physical form between the green carpet of low rise and the high rises of its downtown core. The other is the missing middle that hardly anybody talks about, and that is in the mode of architectural practice a practice that is as committed to building as it is to the discipline of architecture. One that positions itself on the fuzzy threshold between architecture as service and architecture as an art form. We would like to think that jaw is one such practice, one that tries to occupy that missing middle. This video is a register of five minutes of our studio, a flat representation of our time and space, its rituals and its objects. It is one-to-one. -one. One to one reinforces scalelessness of geometry. Different scales of drawings and models of our work are present as objects unto themselves. Their diversity reinforces the presence of geometry as the main theme of our practice. Geometric relationships goes beyond the regulating logic across different scales of one project and becomes the generative engine creating cross-links contaminations across different projects of very different contexts. Objects of our work tends to sit well next to each other. They are strangers unaware of their genealogical links. One-to-one -one works best for light wood frame construction. No other mode of construction is as similar to its one-to-one -one model. To make a mock-up of a wood frame building, perhaps you should build it again. Most of our projects are built in this mode, as are their representation in our office. The models go through a gradual growth in scale from the one inside the office 
to the ones built on site. One to one is nature and our approach to landscape. The history of landscape is the history of drawing onto and with nature. We draw nature with all its leaves, one leaf at a time, while we project shapes onto it. A careful faithfulness in representing the negotiation between entropic nature of ecological processes and the projective willfulness of landscape design as a discipline. We draw everything. And one to one is an immediate representation of mostly doing what we like, to be surrounded by it and gradually sneaking it out into the built world. A middle ground position between pure disciplinary walls and pure earnestness of architectural service. Finally, one-to-one -one is immediate and revealing, where an architectural practice stands between the two poles of corporate framework of the professional practice and the promise of the discipline is best revealed in the ratio of objects, physical and digital, in the office. The ratio of letters versus drawings, the ratio of material samples versus material experiments, the ratio of models versus permit sets. The ratio shown here was almost one-to-one. -one. The rituals and objects around work goes beyond the interior of our office and becomes an extension at a distance. One and a half, a small addition to our office, an accessory building that is not secondary in its use. Instead, its connection to the existing building, to the neighborhood, to life, and to work all helps to define its architectural expression. The new building is an exploration of the geometric and spatial opportunities that arise when space is shaped by a set of planar interior structural members liberating the outer shell from carrying the load. With each floor left open, uses are loosely defined by objects defining the rituals of daily life. Activity spills over across connections between each space, reflecting a condition that architects are only all too familiar with that fuzziness between work and life. The two volumes embody a dialogue between two modes of construction and two tectonics, mass timber in the addition and light wood frame in the office. Light wood frame construction and the expression of the vernacular goes beyond the singular project and it has been a theme of interest in our practice. Boring like this, JAWS finalist proposal for the Canadian Pavilion at the 2020 Venice Biennale proposed an exploration of the historical and contemporary alignment of lightwood frame construction with broader national issues. The project was about extracting a piece of a house or a structure through the act of boring, starting from the roof and going all the way to the ground. This was what we called a bore. 13 architects from across Canada were invited to extract a bore from a lightwood frame structure of their choosing. Much like the surrealist effort to access our subconscious through unexpected juxtapositions, the exquisite corpse, this project was to bore through our architectural psyche, through bits of ornament, leftover roof geometry, and the winding stairs of Victorian houses. In the end, by examining Canada through the lens of lightwood frame construction, latent relationships between Canadian architecture and broader national issues such as ecology, regionalism, colonialism, settlement and immigration was to come to the fore. Lightness was demonstrated 
through large scale tectonic models that swayed back and forth with the lightest of touch. In thinking through lightwood frame construction, a set of our projects struggles with the way in which the known formal repertoire of the vernacular, like gables, dormers, and roof geometries, can start to crossbreed with figures and icons non native to it. This crossbreed tries to stay away from explicit dualities of icon, facade, and space plan, and instead tries to create deeper connections between the profile of an edge and the geometry of the space. While spaces with deep profiles in some projects are pure non-structural surfaces nested within the shed structure, in others the edge of a frame becomes the structure. In some cases, the relationship goes even further and becomes the formal expression of the exterior while the inner organization is triggered by the configuration of the stair. Once the mechanics garage, the building's interior was stripped back and repurposed by dividing the large space into two distinct halves each with a different function and spatial quality. The minimally detailed cafe is juxtaposed with a busy pastry kitchen in full view as customers walk along the serving counter that separates the two. A large barrel vault wraps the front wall over the eating area, stopping short of the serving counter and intersecting with the vault of three large arched windows to create a unique geometry accentuated by natural light. The large custom design and fabricated steel windows takes advantage of the oversized existing garage door openings, creating an icon that offers a framed glimpse of the layered space from the street. Although the true complexities of restoration of a historic building is concealed often within its walls and below its foundation, underscore project's new building tries to blur the boundaries between new and existing. With an art gallery and speakeasy on the ground floor, artist residence and a project space on the second, and co-working artist studios on the third floor. The inverted bay windows on the front facade hints at an intervention while fitting within the existing character of the streetscape. A large skylight using a similar geometry registers the oblique facade while pulling indirect sunlight into the new double height exhibition space at the rear of the building. At the end, three spatial figures, two on the main facade, one on the roof, become more than deep apertures. The front one on occasions opens up to transform into a performance space the top one gets curated to become a gallery at the scale of a light scoop. One in a series of three single family residences with an accessory dwelling unit in Toronto's downtown core, 44 Foxley explores one typological variation. A figurative stair connects the four floors and the profile of an arched bay window becomes a vaulted ceiling that extends the full length of the third floor, connecting the front facade to the rear. This geometric language carries through through the ADU, connecting the buildings and creating a sense of shared courtyard between the two. Much of our studio's recent work are built in one neighborhood, West Green West in Toronto, and can read as different responses to a single prompt. Most of them are located on lots with narrow frontage. This tight constraint has forced us to operate on the space between the efficiency of a familiar type and the unique urban condition offered by the site to reinvent the type. 
this tension between the architecture and the city, the inside and the outside, and the private and the public is typically mediated through the type, number, location of the stairs in each project. There is a one-to-one -one relationship between the place of our practice and the location of our projects. We mostly build in the same neighborhood that we choose to live and work. We like it for the same reason we like to participate in its regeneration. We learn from its subtleties, its multiple histories, neither of which so dominant to be forced to follow or too benign to ignore. They are the experience of the North American city at its best. At the end, one-to-one -one is the physical register of immigration, of being slightly off from the context that you aspire to fit within, struggle with, and eventually change by the virtue of having lived there. Hello, I'm Tian Ng of Tian Ng Design, and I'm an assistant professor in architecture at Taman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, University of Michigan. To give a bit of context, I started my practice in 2004, and prior to that, I worked in architectural offices in New York and taught at various places in the Northeast. I toggle between architectural practice in the traditional sense of realizing a built design and academia, where research is for me a form of experimental practice. I've been teaching at Talman College for almost 14 years. I came as a Sanders Fellow and stayed on to teach and develop my creative practice and research. The shaping of my practice in terms of the modalities of work, the range and scales of production, and disciplinary influences probably could not have happened anywhere else. And that's because of several reasons. One being situated in Northeast Michigan, rooted in the legacy of industrial manufacturing, such as the auto industry. And another is the college itself, being a unique and vibrant place where experimental work is not only valued, but encouraged. An example of the kinds of spaces that sponsors these exchanges is the Liberty Research Annex, which for those who have visited before, know that it's an open warehouse space for faculty research. Office areas flank the long sides of the building with a large flexible space in the middle for various types of full-scale production. But perhaps where my work in the last seven years is most connected to is the Fab Lab at the college, a digital fabrication space that Tom and College is well recognized for. This main high bay area of the lab is where most of my work is conducted. The captions provide some identification to what some of the tools and who the people are in the space. Rather than trying to show an immaculately clean and shiny lab, this is actually what it typically looks like. Lots of work in progress, messy, different types of work coexisting next to each other and even by proximity influence one another. More than the incredible facility, it is also the people at Talman and more broadly at the university that I am most grateful and fortunate to have worked with and learn from over these years. They are inspiring and innovative thinkers who saw research and teaching as in their own practice as creative endeavors. The various projects I've worked on in the last 14 years would not be possible without the interdisciplinary collaborations, the dialogues, and the support. Students are also intrinsic to the development of my practice. Their questions challenge me to constantly rethink my own design motivations and disciplinary boundaries. So I want to take a moment to express my gratitude for these exchanges over the years. And of course, we have a lot of fun doing it. My work is largely material-based. From working at the micro level of how individual fibers get entangled to inhabitable scale that deals with the human body and perception in relation to the city. My work tends to be very time and labor intensive, so naturally I'm drawn to issues of labor in its different facets. 
My work involves rethinking both the tools and the manner by which we manufacture things, to recalibrate our labor and perhaps invent new practices through new technologies that ultimately inform designs more fitting in the contemporary context. Labor for me is also a kind of ethics, which embodies the ethos of work that has political, social, cultural, and economic influences and impact. In almost all my work, labor is there in one form or another. It can be a source of inspiration, or even as a project that aims to highlight the invisible aspects of labor that we are less conscious of today, especially in relation to manufacturing. There are two interrelated threads to my research, scholarship, and creative practice. The first, Satori Architecture, locates the cross-disciplinary potential between the ally industries of clothing manufacturing and architecture. The second, Concrete Labor, centers on concrete research which encompasses design, innovations in experimental forming, and scholarly writing, and often in direct exchange. While seemingly disconnected, these two threads of interest stem from a privately commissioned architectural project completed in 2008. The project called Lafayette 148 for the New York-based fashion label of the same name was done in collaboration with Murda Hadigi of Studio for Architecture. The 11-story concrete building is predominantly a factory for garment manufacturing in Shantou, China. This project has been pivotal in shaping the trajectory of my research and creative practice in the last 15 years. It provided the lens to examine architecture, or more precisely, the production of architecture similar to garment manufacturing as fundamentally a global manufacturing industry, where labor in its many facets and form is interrogated. What has stayed with me after working on this project is the craft and labor intensiveness involved for forming concrete. Concrete in liquid form is not fixed, and my continual pursuit in shaping concrete has to do with the ever-changing labor involved, often invisible since we usually don't see the formwork at the end. Formwork production also includes different material systems such as textile, timber, steel, or plastics, all of which has its own material logic and construction. But with concrete, these data point to the fact that we can't simply operate with the mentality that it's business as usual. So even if innovation is incremental, and there's a lot to improve, it will have a large impact on our built environment given the sheer amount that we continually use for building and for infrastructure. I'll speak more directly through four recent projects. Some are ongoing, but have been initiated in the last four years. They are of different material systems, largely concrete, textile, and timber. These projects are collaborative and multi-year in scope, working with engineers, material scientists, roboticists, and a CNC knitting expert. These material-based research projects highlight the different spheres of research. On the one hand, there's fundamental science, and then there's applied research. And architecture has been more preoccupied with applied research than fundamental science. But there's a huge gap between the two, and the types of work that I've been engaged in actually tries to bridge the two. And this domain is typically considered R&D. R&D does not fall neatly within the architectural discipline. But if we consider what's involved in R&D, there's material research, and these are the ones that I've been most involved in, in terms of concrete, textile, and timber. There's new technologies, particularly uh, digital technologies, which includes CNC automation and techniques for crafting. Part of the work of R&D is building system innovations. For the building industry, design integration requires prototypes to be tested, and various assessments must be quantified. This includes building performance and environmental impact assessments. And lastly, this is the difficult part, um, industry adoption. How to take what is being developed to scale? What will it take for industry to invest and transition to new manufacturing processes? Um, this also involves the lengthy process of establishing codes and standards, and of course, policies. In manufacturing, 
R&D is a moment that coalesces innovation, testing new forms of labor, technology, and material systems together in manners that have not been previously considered. Architecture in the professional sense has not participated in this domain. It mostly involved the building sciences and the building sector where risk management is assumed. However, increasingly, the expertise of architects, especially those engaged in interdisciplinary collaborations, working with digital technologies for design and construction, are directly steering architectural R&D. The agency this brings to architectural research and practice is profound. It expands the domain of participation for architects in building and research. In the process, it also recalibrates how we build, the types of work we do, and simultaneously reevaluates priorities and embedded values of former practices. My motivation in advocating for this area of work is to expand the range of what is possible for design research. Advancing innovations that are not only more in tune with contemporary building practices, but are also aspirational in integrating socially, ethically, and environmentally driven imperatives. In the last three years, I've been working with my collaborators on developing concrete 3D printing processes. The advantages here clearly is that there is no formwork, so there's less construction waste. For us, the motivation in working in this area is in large part being able to direct digital fabrication processes to inform new construction possibilities. There is a lot of research being invested in additive manufacturing processes, our research focus is actually in using this material called ECC. ECC stands for Engineer Cementitious Composite, also known as Bendable Concrete, developed by our collaborator, Dr. Victor Lee at the University of Michigan. The unique performance capacity is different than typical concrete. Much higher tensile strength and more durable. This material has fiber reinforcement, so pumping concrete with fiber is very difficult. Most of what you see being printed today do not have fiber content in there, so there is a lot of challenges to working with ECC. Our focus is also in the robotic deposition process, which involves multi-axis steering for B shaping, with variability in layer thickness, which you can see on the right where the profile of the slab has changing height to the layers. And in this case, by printing directly on the mold, the panel could have a clean finish surface. The other aspect of innovation is demonstrated here, which is the ability to start and stop the printing. Most printing processes have to be continuous because it's really difficult to calibrate the control for starting and stopping. Here, the print doesn't need to be continuous and has opportunities for different types of designs, such as an aperture through this column. This is a continuing project where we are also working with other sustainable practices such as cement replacement that's more environmentally friendly. And because of the durability of ECC, components could be potentially reused, extending the life of what we make and reduce the carbon accounting for the lifetime of the building component. Another ongoing project is a collaboration with Sean Alquist, a CNC knitting expert and Yevgeny Filipov from Civil and Environmental Engineering. Knit casting explores the use of CNC manufactured knits to produce volumetric textile formwork for casting glass fiber reinforced concrete. The research investigates multi-material, functionally graded knit formwork as a fully seamless system to cast concrete. Knits as formwork is very minimal in terms of material use in comparison to traditional wood or steel formwork. The advantages is that you can get complex geometries and textures that would otherwise be difficult to achieve with flat stock materials. So not only does it reduce labor and time in manufacturing a formwork through automation, it also drastically reduces material waste for construction. The formwork is lightweight and transportable and can be deployed for casting anywhere. The formwork design utilizes three distinct knit types, with the fourth which is a combination of two of them. The first on the top left is called tubular or pockets. The second is tethers or spacer knits, which restrains two layers of fabric together with fixed tethers between them. The density and spacing of the tethers can be customized as well as the length of the tethers between the two layers. 
The third panel-to-panel -panel tubular is used to create openings by closing two layers of textiles together for concrete to fill around it. And the last knit type is a combination of spacer and panel-to-panel -panel tubular, with the openings connected to create the double funnel. We develop four distinct typologies, the diagrid, druplet, apertures, and 3D funnel shell. Rather than explicitly defining the predetermined stretch of the knit as the formwork, where the final cast is the exact outcome of the stretched textile, we are working with the dynamic interaction of casting where weight and hydrostatic pressure of concrete is restrained by the 3D knitted formwork, literally inflating the knit with concrete, giving both the concrete and the soft textile its final form. In other words, we don't have the final form until the knit is cast. Here you see the knit for the druplet cast, which employs the use of different materials so that the surface could have different restraining behaviors. Additional exploration looked at global complex geometric deformation, where edges are restrained to allow more material surface to stretch and drop in a non-planar fashion. A balance had to be struck between the ease of formwork removal in consideration of the cast geometry, the knitted formwork, as well as the concrete mix. In this case, a single jersey knit with polyester yarn can be removed quite easily with a clean final finish. We also work with multi-material systems. Here, acrylic is heated and vacuumed over the diagrid cast, creating a complete seal to the panel and offer unique opportunities for apertures. Another aspect of the research is to develop a more comprehensive way to understand the knit and the concrete's behavior, and also to develop simulation models to reduce the number of empirical tests necessary. This project is also ongoing and will continue to refine both the knitting process for the former production as well as the rheological control of the concrete. Robotic needle felting reconsiders an artisan technique called needle felting for non-woven materials, now reinterpreted through robotic processes. Felting uses a barbed needle to punch through the fibers of the material to mesh and bind them together. It essentially entangles the fibers into a solid hole without the addition of sewn thread or adhesive. On the right, you see the mechanical entangling on the backside of the textile when a darker color punches through the white layer below. Non-woven textiles are what we typically call felt material. It comes in natural fibers such as wool, bamboo, or synthetics such as polyester, or blends in different percentages. Our approach to working with this process is to rethink needle felting, which for manufacturing industries have not changed for over 100 years. By linking this process with automated robotic processes, we are now able to work in larger scale, can work with complex surface geometries that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do, and explore design potentials to work with the various characteristics of this material. The research involved three key components that are interdependent. There's the end effector for the needle felting, which is the tool, the different types of material to harness their various characteristics, and we explore different techniques for applications. As a precedent for applying additive manufacturing to a textile process, we looked at automated tape lamination process used widely in aerospace for composite manufacturing. Parameters for this process includes controlling the rate of punching and the start and stop locations along a given path. To enable simulation and control of the process, we develop a workflow that allows these parameters to be precisely influenced by the digital model based on specific geometric inputs. We develop four techniques. The first one, referred to as quilting, forgoes the use of the taping process and relies on a pre-wrapped layup of several layers of felt and batting. This is then needle punched to create a 3D pillow defect. The second technique is called ship lap, this technique has the advantage of being relatively fast and translate easily to 3D surfaces. By controlling the overlap of successive layers, we can add localized thickness as well as modulate the density of the layer. One of the critical variables is the radius of curvature of the path, which also depends on the proportion of the width of the tape to the width of the needle pattern. The process is not limited to panel systems, but can also be used to cover objects such as this poof. 
The final technique is called shingle. It is relatively straightforward in concept, but introduces the ability to vary the length of the unfelted tail of the tape according to the geometry of the surface. For example, in this panel, the tails are getting longer and overlapping less from left to right. These are acoustic panels produced demonstrating the different techniques, and these are panels using the quilting technique. The last and most recent project is called SPLAM, and is a collaboration with Wes McGee and SOM Chicago. It was part of the Chicago Architecture Biennial that took place last fall and is a research project that reconsiders the use of nominal lumber, namely 2x4s that are ubiquitous in the North American context but is usually covered over in domestic architecture. SPLAM is short for Spatially Laminated Timber Construction, and the pavilion demonstrates how this material, when linked with digital fabrication technology, could reduce material use and can be fabricated with automated processes that allow for off-site manufacturing, minimizing on-site construction. In this comparison, for a slab to perform structurally, it uses less material and is optimized to be more efficient to place material where it is needed especially compared to CLTs, where much of the materials is used as fillers. In this image, you can see the thickness varies where the loading stress is most prevalent. The design places the 2x4s in an overlapping sequence, and the use of 5-axis milling allows for scarf joints and overlapping joints to be precisely milled and fabricated. 2x4s are not precise materials to work with. We devised a custom milling jig to ensure that the two types of joints could be precisely positioned so that the assembly process is efficient. All 912 pieces of lumber were milled in our lab, shipped to the site, and the structure was assembled in four days. The system device has a lot of potential, as there's been a lot of interest in timber construction since it's a renewable resource. Through engineering and advanced fabrication processes, new building systems are continuing to improve. So much so that new codes are being developed for timber construction, especially for mid-scale high-rises. One of the most exciting aspects of the project is that we partner with Epic Academy, a South Shore Chicago public school. The pavilion will serve as an outdoor classroom and performance space. Given what we have experienced these past two years with the pandemic, Outdoor learning spaces are not only healthy learning environments, but much needed for schools around the country. Placing such priorities as a programmatic charge, we hope to highlight that innovations are not just for the privilege, but should be embedded as an intrinsic part of the everyday for everyone. By shifting our attention towards socially relevant community-based designs, we hope to highlight that building innovations can happen in parallel to social and educational innovation. I want to thank the Architectural League of New York and the jury for the recognition of this year's Emerging Voices Award. It is an incredible honor and I'm grateful, not just for the award, but also the opportunity to share my work as part of this series. Thank you to Anne Riesenbach and everyone at Architectural League for organizing all the different aspects of this program. It is such a pleasure to engage with everyone and to discuss the different aspects of my practice. I also want to congratulate the other winners this year. I'm delighted to be included in your company. All right, so thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, both practices. Um, I thought the videos were, were pretty great. Um, what we're going to do is I have a couple of questions I'm going to ask each of you. Um, to anyone in the audience, if you would like to ask a question, that would be very much welcomed. Um, we have a Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you want to use the q and I'll be monitoring that. Please do not use the chat. It gets a little bit too confusing to try to go between the chat and the uh, Q&A session. So if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A and I'll try to weave them into the conversation. So. Uh, as I said in the, in the quick intro, I, I feel like there's a number of kind of um, topics that in some way mirror each other. Um, and for Tian, research is, is clearly a, a major part of your practice. It's, a, it's highlighted in your video, but it's, it's something that you um, are very deeply embedded in uh, at the lab in, um, in Michigan. 
So Benaz and Nima, I wonder for you, what, what is the role of research in your practice? Mm -hmm. I, you know, for example, the research uh, on uh, on wood frame or light wood frame construction that we showed and we, we proposed for Venice Biennale Pavilion, it actually came, so maybe in our case, it's the reverse, meaning that we, our interest was initially uh, in, in, you know, in form and geometry. And as we started building buildings, we had to translate it to the kind of the vernacular mode of construction. And that wasn't actually, we, we maybe even preferred more monolithic modes of construction, but there was something about using um, a method of, method of construction that, that is common to accommodate the kind of uh, formal ambitions that we had. And sometimes through that, you know, even if it wasn't even through a uh, lot, you know, desire, uh, but we realized there is something happening between this kind of trans using a method that is non native to the to the you know the formal interest that we had and then through that we started reading about the work of Vincent Scully and you know Shingle style and also the history of it and we realized you know there is that history that even originally the North American architecture had this kind of duality between the source of its aspirations and the method that it was using so it was something that and then we became more and more interested so it started through practice and then as we were, you know, we started realizing there is that depth and, you know, teaching always helps you to, yeah. to pursue that as part of uh, your research. So it, become, it comes after the observations that we have in, in, the, in our work. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, I mean, I think, yeah, the, if you think of the process of, I mean, I agree 100% with Nima that the, we, we, we went from the other end of the, the process, which is we, the construction part. But then um, also, I think that the whole process of, of architecture and is a, like almost like a nonlinear process. It's messy and, and, and I, I like iterative. And I think we, the research comes when we start testing our ideas and we do that a lot. We do that, we do a lot of the things that, that are not asked of us to do. And we like to do that regardless. Uh, and I think that's where the research part comes in. And of course we have, um, that is not something we can uh, put it as part of the contract. That is the part that we like to do. And we usually, uh, that, that's where the teaching comes in and the support of uh, the institutions that we work with, with like the Cooper Union in New York or at UFT in Toronto, um, which are the thing that, what, what we use as a support system for our research. It also, you know, looking at the sort of scope or the span of your work, it also feels like there's a kind of, um, you know, not not only not necessarily a typology, but there's this idea that the stair and the relationship of the stair to the space is something that you're continuing sort of iteratively working on, almost as a form of research. Yes, yes, it's true. It 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 again comes from. Um, the desire to form and at the same time understanding how you can form within the constraints that is offered within within urban lots and that their similarities so there is that relationship between finding a generic condition happening in, you know over and over again and you're you know caught in the middle of that repetition and trying to you know formulate or find a desire to form uh, uh, you know um a new spatial condition that is generally triggered by the stair. So we notice overall the stairs are protagonists of what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Tian, in a kind of reverse way, um, I want to ask a, a question that came out of um, Benaz and Nima's presentation. The idea for them of one-to-one -one is super clear. It's highlighted uh, in the video. Um, and your work, with the exception maybe of the, um, the building in Chantal, is almost also exclusively one-to-one. -one. Uh, was that a, a decision? And I would even argue the, uh, the building in Chantal feels one-to-one -one in many ways because of the fins, right? They're, they're literally fabricated at scale. There's no kind of, um, yeah, they're, they're literally fabricated at scale. Um, how did your work, or was it, was it an intentional decision to work one-to-one? -one? Is it a result of the material? Like, could you talk about the role of scale in your work? Yeah, the, the scale is, uh, um, is complicated um, because sometimes it can be small, sometimes it can be big, but, but mostly it's really about harnessing um, material studies and understanding what it could do, um, how do we change its, uh, 
properties or um, bring surprises um, and, and perhaps even um, afford different ways of working with the material that is more contemporary. And so I, 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 I do find that the the one to one, um, there, there's definitely, uh, I'm so glad that we're paired together um, today because there's definitely a lot of um, similarities and correspondences. You know, the, yeah, the, the kind of like working with the material and directly addressing what is the, what, what are the tectonics? What are, what are the questions? How to, how to kind of like put a spin on things. Um, so I think like I, it's, it's really hard to do that without working. You have to work one to one in order to do that, right? So that's that's something um, that it finding unexpected um, properties requires a kind of dwelling in into the material. So that's a definitely one to one experience. Right. So we have a question in the chat, and I just want to reiterate, if you have a question from the floor, please do drop it in the chat. The chat button is at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, and I'm going to elaborate a little bit on the question, because I think it could be a question for both uh, JAR Architecture Studio and Sien. Um, there's a kind of interesting, I don't know if you all are aware of this, but we all lived in Canada at one point. So we have a <laughs> weird Canadian connection. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. <laughs> um, that's another story, but uh, the question is, uh, is this, um, considering, and it for JA Architecture Studio, considering your background and the sense of offset you mentioned, the influence of Persian architecture is quite visible in your projects. How do you approach this influence and the integration with contemporary architecture? And maybe if I could sort of open that up a little bit, if I know, Tian, you, your work, um, you ha you've had a project that sort of was framing um, the identity of Taiwan Maybe if both of you could talk a little bit about identity and architecture and, and how your own personal narrative has um, sort of shifted, changed, developed, et cetera. Maybe we can start with, um, with Ja Architecture Studio. The, um, it's, it's, it's one of those questions that we always struggle with in terms of how, um, you know, it's a tricky question, how you want to be referential to you know, another architecture. And, and it has multiple, pro, you know, multiple uh, reasons for that uh, hesitation. One is it's hard to even recognize the contemporary Persian architecture because we went to some, you know, the history of architecture education as a discipline um, is not that local. So, there, you know, it's, and there's so much similarities in school of architectures across uh, the world, I would say. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, so, for that reason, I, I'm not sure if, but I also understand the question that there are certain moments in our work that we realize uh, we are slightly, we are registering certain elements in our work. Sometimes it's the use of brick and through screening brick, but at the same time, that's something that is also has, you know, uh, enough references in, in, you know, in the contemporary practices uh, all across. Um, we so right now we've been careful. The, the best moments that we, you know, the feedback that, or the reviews or reading of the work that we got is sometimes when uh, our projects within the context, you know, in Canada and Toronto, they're slightly off. There are never references, direct references to any any other direct location, but they're slightly off, and that's why those are the best moments that we think something, you know, is the right amount of being referential, but also not because there is nothing that clear to reference it from. Yeah, I, I think like the references, uh, if if any, it's um, not conscious that much. It's more our interest in geometry and form is the driver of every project. But eventually, I think somehow it seeps through uh, the projects because we've we didn't notice it. But then we've got this comment that these projects are uh, just off enough from the context. Uh, and I think that is that is perhaps um, our backgrounds coming through, but definitely it's. Mm, I don't think I don't call it intentional. It's yeah. not like we're. Well, it's also with, not unconscious. Yeah. It's like our culture is coming. Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, but so. but it, I would say like architecture in Iran is not that. It's it's very like yeah. Westernized right yeah. now. So it's. Um, That's very true. Like yeah, even Iranian contemporary architecture has a struggle of how to be referential to Iranian architecture at some level because the methods of production, the, you know, the, 
you know, the, the development of the city, all of that makes that referentiality, even in the context of Iran, not that easy to do. And that's a challenge for, uh, I mean, you know, across. Yeah, yeah, I think I think the, I, the thing that the oddity or the offness comes from the interest in geometry and the unforgiving ca characteristic of the mode of construction here, which is like with frame, and our attempt to marrying the two creates these perhaps odd conditions that Fictions are, in the yeah. That, that are interesting. In, in, and, and, and that's the, basically the part that we are conscious of. Mm -hmm. So, Tian, do you want to add a comment to that? Um, as far as I, I think identity is, it's hard for me to pinpoint that because I just exist between places and uh, cultures. Um, and so I think that in, in a way that probably reflects on my practice because I am maybe not the traditional sense of like, you know, architecture practice, but there's um, the type where I'm, I'm most interested in are those all those gaps, those cracks that a lot of people don't really um, don't really think about, but like, and and I think also that's I, I see that in 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 um, in your practice too um, that there's you know what you talk about at the very beginning like the kind of missing middle um, things that maybe often when you are really familiar with anything you often overlook, but when you are foreign there's a kind of recognition. And so, and, and actually in, in a sense, like celebrating those moments is, is what I see as kind of um, um, interesting, at least for me, so. Yeah, so again, to those folks in the, in the Zoom room, um, please feel free to drop in your Q&A uh, in the, or any questions you might have in the Q&A. Um, another thing that I, as I mentioned, I thought were kind of interesting relationships were, um, the relationship between material and geometry in both of your practices. And you've talked about geometry now quite a bit just in this conversation. Um, your geometry tends more to be platonic um, in the sense that we, we see a lot of, you know, half circle arches, etc. cetera. Um, but that's always sort of dealing with funky, really like every project seems to be super narrow. So trying to deal with this, this a kind of condition that's very quite, quite difficult. Um, and Tian, you're, the geometry, if I may, in much of your projects seems to be about um, gravity, about the weight of material, about the path of a robot, right? About things, things maybe that are sometimes less controlled, right? So it's, you know, the, the 3D printing isn't a really, really clean um, thing, like things fall and they slump, et cetera. So what, what do you think is there, for, for both of you, what is the relationship um, and I want to go back really quickly to the uh, Venice Biennale uh, coring uh, project. I, I remember when I was in second year, I had to, I was in a, like a light framing course and I had to frame a, a, a house and I actually learned more about how to frame a house than I did in like any of my other architecture school. So I love the project. I love the, the models behind you both. Um, but the coring, it it's almost seems like the geometry is working against the material condition, right? Um, so could you talk about the relation, both of you talk about the relationship between material and, and, uh, and geometry or form? I think sometimes they work in convergence and there is a history of like important authors in architecture that you know, can think of Khan, you can think of many architects that they were trying to understand the material behavior and form to converge towards certain configuration. We also like the frictions. We, that's why we, we were talking about when formal behave, when formal desires and the, the tectonic behaviors do not always converge. And the question of, uh, we, we, uh, we had this term of divide and conquer, sometimes geometry and construction, they don't need to necessarily go along. As long as architect can express that moment of, of friction, there's an expression there. And sometimes we go along that. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess I can talk about that. The, the geometry, I think, has um, a lot to do with celebrating certain aspects of tectonics um, and or even thinking about how geometries become um, elegant in integrating various aspects of, of performance, right? Not just the, let's say, formal aspect, um, but the, but how the, 
the integration itself is uh, is a is an elegant process, um, and that's actually I, I think that's a lot of work involved in integrating those things, and or or actually separating those things out too. You know, I think like in in the case of like what what I'm seeing in the the core project, I think it's like it's I'm fascinated about your your the your practice because um, in in certain actions for um, actually making like a timber frame a, a gentle curve you have to completely change the structure right yep. and you have to completely restructure everything and it's that restructuring that i think is really like in that that's the intellectual part that's really interesting for me and so i think for myself the the kind of geometry is really about um, celebrating it, but also how do you rethink and, and, and make it work in different ways? So we have a couple of questions in the in the chat or in the uh, Q and A. Uh, one is directed to Tian. Um, when can robotic concrete home manufacturing be ubiquitous in all locations, especially in New York? That sounds like a loaded question from someone who <laughs> either really really wants it or really doesn't want it. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and you're the expert in the panel right now. So what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that is a loaded question. Um, it, it's, well, this is, this is like ongoing, ongoing research and there's actually so much, you know, work out there right now that is on printing homes. Um, and I, I'm not sure that, I think there's a lot of buzz but to say that is going to be done well is going to take a bit of time. Is it to the point where, let's say, the idea is for the consumer to have a very fantastic home that is, you know, low maintenance. Um, there's still a lot of questions about what, what, you know, printing a monolithic thing. You know, I don't, I don't know that many things that is like a monolithic thing, right? Um, as far as the building goes. So I, there are a lot of challenges. I'm not sure if it's going to be, certainly there's a lot of places that are doing it tomorrow um, in one day, but um, I do think if we are talking about quality um, and how to bring that technology to, um, for a wider adoption, uh, that's gonna take a, take a bit of time. So the person who asked the question said that they want, wanted an answer for the record. So there you go. Um, we have a, a, a um, 3D printed house here in Phoenix, and the, uh, the challenges of working with concrete in the desert are many. Um, and one of them is the, the heat. And so the uh, concrete was, was uh, setting in the tube, actually. So they were putting like, pools out with ice water to try to cool it down. And it, it, it didn't quite work. So there's some technical issues, unforeseen technical issues that actually dealt with things like weather. So. Um, there's another uh, question in the chat for you, Xian. Uh, can you elaborate on your timber techniques and how that relates to cross laminated timber? What is the maximum load you've calculated? Um, I, I, I guess this is on record too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually, I, I try not to do calculations because we have engineers that, are work, that worked on the project that um, helped us with the calculation. Um, but as far as um, it's the, the cross laminate, cross laminate timber was about working with um, optimizing where the structure is necessary for the stress to be carried um, through the, in terms of load to be carried. But it was also about thinking about two by fours, you know, celebrating two by fours um, instead of covering it. And also um, the, the splicing and the kind of layering allows um, the use of the material more efficiently. Um, so shorter pieces could be spliced as a, as a longer pieces, as a longer piece, but, um, but as a slab is really designed and optimized as a, um, as, as a, as a system. So I, I, I hope that explains a little bit, but in terms of the calculation, I can't give you the numbers, but we did test all the joints um, in terms of what the, what the, what the stress, the tension low and, and, um, 
and and calculations was actually like approved um, by the building department. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one, I mean, just as an observation, one major difference is that you can actually see somewhat of a load flow in the form, whereas with CLT, it doesn't matter. It's a, you know, just it is what it is. Um, so again, if you're interested to ask a question, please drop it in the Q&A. Um, this is a, um, I'm new to this whole process. I, I was a jur juror this year for the first time. And going into it, I didn't really know what to expect. I, I was able to look at some and get become more familiarized with some really, really fantastic practices. Um, but there's a, an idea that there's an emerging voice happening here. And I think both of you are, are pretty clear, uh, have a pretty clear voice, or both practices have a clear vo voice. Um, but let me ask the question, um, where's your practice in 20 years? What do you think, um, wh what will you be working on um, what would be success for you in 20 years? And maybe, Tian, I'll start with you. Um, maybe coming back to the question from before, um, if we can um, build with concrete, whether 3D printed or not, um, that is carbon negative, that would be fantastic. All right, so a carbon negative concrete future. How are you? Uh, are you going to? I mean, I think um, I think the next step for our project, um, which um, would be to change to where to to enter a different type, like to move into program uh, projects that are more maybe civic or public projects. Um, and I mean, that is, of course, has been a challenge because we are very particular about um, maintaining that um, non-linear um, aspect of our time and projects. Uh, so for that, I think that that would be our challenge, but I think we're hoping to enter that, that realm in the next 10 years. Essentially how we can keep our, um, you know, the studio culture and also the relationship that we've established between, you know, uh, ourselves and the projects that we are doing. The, the, the best moments of our projects are the projects that kind of uh, they become interesting moments in the city. So it comes from that observation that still the best experience of architecture is within the context. It's in the experience of the city, not even context, within the experience of the city. And we love to be able to kind of practice that kind of, because those mo there are moments that you see that architecture is being recognized in the moments that the city that didn't really need architecture. I'm talking about how it's being used how it relates to the conditions of the street and those are good moments and if we can and it comes from the way we engage with these projects and even the formation of the programs the way that the clients of those interesting projects had envisioned it so those if it can become engaged in that kind of in the spirit of creating those moments those urban moments in more public and civic projects as Mel was saying i think that would be a success for us mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems like you're you're starting with a bakery project, and that seems like a project that's really trying to work that way. Um, so I, I wonder, um, and this isn't a, a question I'm expecting you to answer, but I wonder then as the scale goes up, what is the relationship between stick frame construction, et cetera, that might be would change, right? Um, that's true. CLT, you know, mass timber in general, but CLT specifically was something that because of you know our experience with by uh, frame construction. I started, you know, there was, you know, I taught the housing studio at Cooper Union and tried to use CLT for, you know, multi-unit housing. And I, and because, my, you know, my, you know, our interest comes from also trying to work with the, on the limits of systems. There were moments that I, you know, I was a bit disappointed. And when it comes to our project in the back, so many of those things that we were trying, so we were, we wanted to, you know, uh, explore you know, oblique connections mm -hmm. within CLT. And that's something that has something in great, you know, that has a contradiction, in great contradiction with the way the laminar, you know, uh, uh, production of CLT works. And uh, so, so definitely light wood frame construction would not be, but CLT only if we find those moments of interest, how our work can, can come sometimes in, you know, incorporating the system, but also sometimes can create these you know, the conditions, uh, you know, can become in, uh, can generate frictions that are not immediately the system generating the project, but the project finds moments of friction 
with, you know, with the desires of the architects or the conditions of site or things like that that we are very interested in. Um, so we have another question in the chat, or excuse me, in the q and I keep saying that. Um, and if you have any other question, or if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. And this is specifically for Jot Architecture Studio. You discussed your experiments with materials and geometries. What importance do you give to lighting in your designs? Light and materials are mutually dependent on each other. Lighting? Lighting, like formal lighting? Lighting, like artificial lighting? Like, I think the question might be uh, both natural and artificial lighting. Do you think about lighting in your projects, or is it is it maybe less of an import than, say, the formal uh, and the geometric and the material qualities? I mean, we do. Yeah, I mean, I mean, lighting and I mean, they go, they they they're always working together, like the skylight in the gallery space or the the arched windows of Forno and how. Uh, we considered lighting that kind of helps the reading of the that complex geometry of the the arch windows meeting the barrel walls within um so that's uh, that's as part of natural lighting and artificial lighting we're very like less artificial less, artificial less... lighting is at the level of you know specking which is not a very <laughs> but um yeah i think our buildings are generally developed in plan through its relationship with the city and typology and its section is always light. So how the building can respond to a way of getting natural light. And because there are tight conditions, it's always there. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere between our desire to see, because th th there's a moment above the use that generally form is liberated from you know, the conditions of, uh, of function and it finds other alibi for its you know, formation. And generally light is a good alibi. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a good answer. So we have another question in the Q&A for uh, Tsien. Something I found quite interesting about Tsien's project is that the form isn't materialized until the moment the whole structure is produced. So there's an element of surprise. I'm interested in about, I'm interested in, sorry, there's a bit of a, a typo here. So I'm interested in to maybe to learn more about the form making process of jar architects, for example. The project about lightness is really interesting. Did you come up with the idea through model making in which the element of surprise can usually be found? Does a sense of surprise usually happen during your work process? So maybe we could start with Sien and talk about, because uh, I know like I've worked with fabric form concrete, there are surprises, <laughs> things blow up, um, it happens. Um, so could you talk about maybe uh, a moment when there was a surprise in the final form and then for job architecture studio maybe you can talk about what is the role of surprise in your model making and i hope that does the answer does the question justice um i i can give an example of surprise um so the the knit casting project where um the cnc knit is maybe you know about this big or something and then when you start putting concrete in it it stretch like four times the size, right? And so you you think it's gonna go down this much and then you realize, oh, it's still going and it's still going. Um, and in some ways those surprises um, is, it's really interesting because it pushes the material to do far more than you think it could. And and for me, that is, those moments of surprises um, are, are definitely um, celebrated, so. Do we have surprise? I think the one that you, uh, I think the note, uh, the, you know, Mark, the thing that you mentioned about a circular cut that has no relationship to the conditions of plan was an, in, you know, was an interesting finding because initially, as part of um, the Venice Biennale, we liked the idea of inviting, you know, other architects, but we also we are not essentially curators of that sense. So we liked, we wanted to make sure that these objects would be, mm -hmm. you know nice object and 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 starting from an object you know we were representing Ontario and um, and when we started designing a version of a of a cylindrical uh, cut of a house when we were too conscious of it we realized the random cuts are actually more interesting and that's why we we asked because initially we didn't know how to what to ask other architects I think I remember we we were thinking about asking them to design something with like with frame 
And the moment that we realize, even when we want to design, mm -hmm. it's less interesting than we just find a moment in plan that seems interesting. And then you see the outcome by actually cutting it. And in the production, we realized, because these were big models and you know, some of our interns were actually came from knowing carpentry, we realized cut, you know, modeling things in Rhino versus measuring it on the, you know, there was a small scale because it was quarter scale and, and doing it in, um, on the, you know, very much similar to the job site was, you know, those, those moments that digital falls behind, the kind of intuitive and, and local or like uh, real, those are interesting moments for us to observe. And when it happens, it's, uh, it's, it's really good. Yeah. So one moment of surprise for me was when uh, in their video, when you walked up and sort of blew on the model and it started dancing. <laughs> me or Ben as well. Which one? Uh, I did a better job. You did, you did. <laughs> the surprise, surprise was I, I, I choreographed that moment for my walk for this thing to move and it didn't. And I don't know <laughs> how to go on the top, the top. That's oh, yes. the point. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's great, that's great. We have another question in the Q&A um, for Bernard and Nima. Using Kipnis's architectural classification system, where would Ja Architecture Studio ground itself in and around? One, conceptual, two, phenomenological, or three, performative? The easy answer would be somewhere between all three. Because <laughs> we are definitely not conceptual in that sense. I think we are. Um, we are phenomenological, no, we are not, but we appreciate any phenomenological thing that happens after construction, the condition of life, or, you know, by the moment, because that's something that is hard to curate it before. There is something about expression of material that you go by intuition, but it's not quite part of design. It's more about intuition. And what was the last one? Uh, performative. Performative. Perform we are, we're not that performative. No. We, we try to, you know, build and, and exist, but that, I mean, the, the performance, if I understand it in the level of... Um, well, I mean, uh, arc, an arc of light. Yes, but those performances, like, you know, the boring, for example, it performs, but uh, we worked on the base to really uh, give us the, you know, we were precise on those moments, how, it, you know, it can, because previously we noticed the geometry, is affecting how this thing works. So we really worked on that, mm -hmm. uh, those bases to, to have a degree of control. And if, but if performative means functional, I would say we are, we are only interested in those moments that function is connected to life and, 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 and body in those moments. And it's usually that kind of observational side uh, is our interest less about um, choreographing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a really good distinction of function between performative function and mechanical function. And those are very different things. Um, and I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not sure where uh, Jeff Kipnis lies on that side. So yeah. I don't know, it's a good question. I should know, um, but I don't. Um, you mentioned uh, both of you teach, or I should say, I believe both of you teach. Um, um, and obviously, Tian, you're at Michigan. What's been the role of, um, what's been the role of academia? In your practice, um, how has that? Um, you know, Tian, you're teaching full time. Um, you're teaching part time uh, at Cooper in, in Toronto. What's the role of academia for you? I think it's very similar to what Tian said. It's uh, at the end of her, her video that um, we practice what we teach and we teach what we practice. It's the one to one relationship between our teaching and our practice as well. We uh, teach. If the things that we are interested in. Nima Studios has always been related to, I mean, you should talk about your studios, but it's very heavily geometric uh, about geometry. And, uh, and I also teach uh, both in architecture and landscape architecture. So um, um, I'm, I'm, I kind of sometimes fall into more into Tian's uh, material gestures and I love exploring with materials. Uh, partially that's maybe because of um, art landscape architecture background that I have uh, and I also teach in landscape uh, which in fact has an impact on our site plans and the, the way we kind of um, um, deal with hydrology, ecology and uh, geology on our site. Um, 
I, th I think academia, there's a, um, and I've been lucky in terms of having a certain freedom to explore topics that um, may not be, may not be sexy or may not pay well, or, you know, it's, it's not determined by a commission or, um, so I think um, I've been, I feel very lucky to have in, to be working in academia, to have that space to explore um, more experimental things. Um, I'm not defined by, um, I mean, there's always a budget, but I'm not defined by um, certain um, demands. Um, I, I, yeah, that, that is a, a difference for me as, you know, being in, doing research in academia. I, I would also just add that I was really impressed with the amount of collaboration across uh, the university that you have. Um, I teach at ASU and like I am constantly amazed to find out that there's a specialist on pretty much everything. Like so if you want someone who, you know, knows how, um, you know, freeways work relative to like moose crossings in arid climates, there's there's a pro there's a center for that here, you know, like it happens. So anyways, it's a really good like it's a very fertile ground and I feel Michigan is very similar in that way. Yeah. All right, so we uh, don't have any more questions in the Q&A. Um, we're gonna wrap up pretty soon. I wanted to um, ask or maybe give the opportunity for the two practices to ask each other a question. So for uh, Tien to ask a question to Benas and uh, Nima and Nima and Benas to ask a question to Tien. And either of you can go first, I'll leave it up to you. Who Can you to go first? <laughs> no pressure. Um, hey, I've been asking all questions for about 45 minutes now. So, <laughs> um, well, actually, maybe maybe I can ask a question in regard to um, maybe coming back to Mark, what you what you mentioned about the at the beginning about non fetishizing um, certain things. Um, what, 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 what are your pet peeves in the way that certain things are fetishized and for you, it's like, it's not about that. What, 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 what would be something? Well, it would be the moment that we, because we do fetishize certain things, but I just, so your question is about our relationship to fetishized objects or where are the moments of a fetishization that we don't endorse. <laughs> well, like it, 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 either, um, either, either way, or um, or at, at what part of the spectrum do you find yourself like really fetishizing something and not so much? You know, it's fair to say we like certain forms, and uh, we like them in different scales. Sometimes we realize, and and it happened. You know, even when we did our. When we collect our work, we realize, you know what? It has nothing to do with this concert hall. We like this thing. Sometimes it's a door handle. And we also see it in other architects. And I think part of going back to that question of teaching, the best thing about teaching is you, you externalize that because you see your students, they exhaust that territory, then you have to move to other places. And traditionally architects, sometimes without knowing, they just keep having those you know, suppressed, fetishized moment, just repeating itself over and over again. And the best thing about teaching is, you don't even do it at least too much, or you're aware of it. I think we are aware, aware of it, but I think that one of the reasons we like those frictions is when material misbehaves and doesn't allow our formal uh, pure moments to remain pure, and they, they get tested through that friction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, and a question. Um, yeah. I, 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 I go first and you can sure, ask sure. your own I question. Have we, don't, we have different, um, but I, I was watching uh, the lecture, uh, your video, and what the, 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 my favorite part was that uh, dress that was made out of paper or, or newsprint or something. It was amazing. Like the, then there was the shot of the, the horizontal thing. And I, I was looking at that and then I saw the, uh, these, um, what do you call it, felt, concrete um, mm -hmm. and it was there was there is a sewing part of the of your process uh, there's softness in that but then then I saw the last project which was timber uh, wood 
Uh, and I want to know which the, which of these two ends of that spectrum you fall into. Would you prefer to continue more? Was, was the wood thing something that's going to be your future, or are you going to be staying in the concrete and this development? Um, well, based on um, the the kind of sartorial work that I do, um, the idea of textile having a role in architecture that's always going to probably be there. Uh, maybe not maybe not the material itself, but in terms of processes for manufacturing, um, because mm -hmm. it's very tied to architecture. But concrete is my kind of love, even though no one loves it these days. Um, oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, sand, yes, we know, but I think everybody loves concrete. Yeah, so I, I, I do, I, and, and I'm not restricted to a singular material, I would say, um, because in making form work is, you know, timber is a major part of it. Um, so it's not the material per se, but the kind of craft and labor or rethinking of those labor in construction or making that's 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 what fascinates me so. mm -hmm. i also have a question and it's i was hoping that benos would not ask my question i'm very happy to do that. um so there was a moment in your video that students rolled a concrete piece and it was going forward then it, got, it went backward and it's this question of you know dynamicism that is in some of your static pieces versus a moving part that is so precisely shaped that it actually does not go along how you expect it to to go so would you um and and i and i thought that's a very interesting territory that that moment i realized there is some interesting relationship between static dynamic forms like the one that is uh, you know in your background and, and odd objects that have, they do not express a sense of movement, but when you roll them, they express movement, but also a surprising moment of awe. And I know it can happen through the workup, but I thought there is something very uh, interesting in, in that moment in the work, which I thought is quite interesting. So would we see more of that as well? Or because within the world of concrete, um, moving pieces. Um, I'm not so sure. I my 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 those that project actually my current students. There are two of them that are working on that, so I think they're very happy. They will be very happy to know that people are like excited about that. Um, the the movement with concrete, I think, has to do with its liquid form, and that for me has always been all, the challenge, right? Controlling that, shaping mm -hmm. that, and. So as as far as the um, yeah. the movement, um, maybe not not actual movement to concrete, but maybe re, um, sort of changing how we think about concrete being static and monolithic, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think part of like one one of the biggest surprise for the Lafayette one forty eight the the factory in Chantel was about the facade dematerializing by the artificial light behind it, right? So like this sense of like unexpected, um, it's, it's not so much about this, just the physical movement, it's like how to control the making and forming so that it is something else, it becomes something else, so. Thank you. All right, well, I wanted to thank um, all of you. It's um, I, I do I do wish we could have all met in person. It would have been great to continue the conversation over some dinner and maybe a glass of wine. Um, maybe next year, we don't know. But the other good part is that I'm able to, we're able to see everybody. Um, Toronto, Michigan, New York, I'm in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So it's nice that we can all connect. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Anne and the Architectural League for doing this. It's an incredible project, incredible program. And thank you very much uh, for inviting me to play a very, very small part in it. Congratulations, Tian. Uh, congratulations, uh, Benas and Nima. I'm really inspired by your work and I wish you all the best in the future. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Anne. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. I think I can only echo what Mark said. It was both presentations were tremendous. Both were so clearly outlined. We hadn't thought about some of the relationships and through the years, the relationships that come through in these paired lectures are 
always fascinating. We also hadn't thought about the geographic congruence. Actually, your two firms are probably the closest to each other, anybody who was speaking this year, which is really sort of fascinating. So we thank you very much. And a plug for next week, where we're going to sort of stretch and go in very different directions and very much occupy the landscape with landing studios work with landscape and infrastructure in Boston and MMX with public architecture and landscape in Mexico City. So please come back and join us. And thank you all for taking part this week. Thank you so much.